Hello, everyone, and, and welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. Today's discussion is about partnering with the C-suite to tackle ESG. Um, we are 50-50 Women on Boards, the leading education and advocacy campaign driving the movement towards gender balance and diversity on corporate boards. And we're excited today to partner with Ceres and also Berkeley School of Law. Um, I'm not gonna take up too much time. I'm just gonna pass it over to Amelia so she can get started with the conversation, but please engage in the chat and ask questions. We know this will be a fruitful discussion for everybody in attendance and we're happy to have you here. Amelia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather, for the uh, generous invitation uh, to moderate this panel. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so as Heather mentioned, we're going to be looking at how to effectively partner with the C-suite on addressing environmental and social uh, risks and opportunities. Um, and I'm extremely excited about this topic because it's, it's very tactical, and I've learned quite a bit from Emily, from Lisa, from Nancy, uh, and Sylvia uh, about this topic. And I look forward to getting concrete examples and case studies. And my research and scholarship focuses on uh, board oversight of ESG. And one thing that's underappreciated is just how important it is for the board to be informed. And the way that the board gets its information is going to be the topic of, um, of this discussion. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our guests, uh, to Nancy, Emily, Lisa, and Sylvia in that order to, uh, to introduce yourselves, please. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Nancy Heinen. Um, I have the benefit at this age of having multiple stages of, of life. My first was as a corporate lawyer. Um, and the last 12 years of that, we're working for Steve Jobs, first at a company called Next, and then a company called Apple that we turned around and brought from sort of death's door in 1997 to the company that is the powerhouse it is today. I left Apple to engage in venture philanthropy and in impact investing to really look at the problems that are so difficult to solve that not every product can. And in the course of that, I've been working with social entrepreneurs and serving on boards to try and help them express and operationalize the impact they wanna have both in a business context and on the social and environmental governance causes that are dear to them. I look forward to this panel. I know I'll learn a lot. This is an evolving area and we are all trying to advance it forward. So I'm happy to be part of the conversation. Okay, I might be next. Hi, sorry about that. Um... It was unable to start my video. Actually, if I could get our host set series and 50-50 uh, to please turn all cameras on for the speakers, that would be great. Thank you. Emily, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'm Emily Leggett. And I am, let's see, I'm an engineer by training and my whole career has been in technology-based companies, which when I graduated in the 70s, that was DuPont as a really a chemical materials company until I've been in much more what we would consider Silicon Valley tech since then. So. I've, um, you know, I've been in product development and manufacturing and sales and marketing in the past 20 years in general management and CEO of both public and privately held companies. And I joined my first uh, board probably almost 20 years ago. I was asked to mentor a female CEO. And I learned that as a board member, I, was, I thought I was a better board member because I was the CEO and I was definitely a better CEO because I sat on a board and I I understood, so I learned the hard way of what should be the role and not the role. And of course, it is different between privately held institutional, you know, um, venture companies and public boards. Um, about, I guess, two years ago, I sold my last company and, and have been strictly involved with now consulting, advising, and sitting on boards. So I'm on three public three and three private boards and one foundation that does climate investing. So I'm thrilled to be here to share uh, what I've learned and mistakes that I've made and, and as we all learn about this evolving area. Thank you so much, uh, Emily and Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Bougie. I'm very happy to be here with you today. I have spent the vast majority of my career building brands and businesses through disruptive retail. 
but I left my operating role three years ago to develop a portfolio of leaders and businesses that I support in three ways, board work, advising, and investing. Um, what ties those three forms of engagement together is I work exclusively in support of leaders and companies that are working with a mission orientation toward wellness, climate action, and social justice. As such, I am very much an ESG enthusiast and um, looking forward to a vibrant discussion with you all today. Thank you so much. So now we've introduced uh, Nancy, Emily, and Lisa for, for primarily for the board perspective, and we have, and now we're moving to the C-suite with Sylvia. So Sylvia, if you could introduce yourself briefly. Yes, um, hello everyone. I'm very, very happy to join this wonderful discussion and objective of um, providing balance um, to our, our board composition. Um, as uh, Amelia mentioned, I um, am in the C-suite for the Royal Caribbean Group, where I serve as their senior vice president and chief environmental, social and governance officer. And in that capacity, um, I work closely with the board and with um, other members of senior management to ensure that ESG is fully integrated operationalized um, and, and measured um, in terms of our strategy, our risk management, our goals and target setting, as, as well as our governance. Um, so I also look forward to a, a great discussion and, and, and good questions. Okay, so thank you for those introductions. And with that, I'm just going to jump right into our first question, which is something that I've discussed with, with each of you, discussed and debated with each of you in the past, and it's a, it's a line drawing yeah. problem, which, you know, it, it's probably very easy to do theoretically as we do in corporate law. Here's the role of the board, here's the role of management. But what I've appreciated in my conversations with you is how hard it is to draw that line in practice. Um, so I will start with you, Emily, on how, how do you articulate the role of the board in overseeing ESG versus the role of management? You know, I think in general, it's not different than the role of the board in any area, right? Whether it's cybersecurity or strategic planning or, you know, hiring, that kind of thing. I think what's different about ESG is that you know, while it has been around in some form or another for a long time, it's really the last few years that it's gaining a lot of momentum. And, you know, while we thought COVID might cause it to lose momentum, it actually, I think, gained momentum because there was so much to learn and, and think about with that. But I think the role of the, um, you know, the general, the role of management is to actually execute, right? They, they run the business day to day. It's their business. And these are publicly traded companies. Uh, the role of the of the board, of course, is, is oversight and maybe some counsel and advice. I think what we find that gets a little unbalanced here is that some, some people can be really passionate about all or some of ESG, you know, it's climate or it's diversity or, you know, whatever it is. And, and that's, they might be, management might be really excited and the board's not or vice versa. And so, you know, within each group, within in management, within the board, there should be really a lot of discussion about it and a lot of learning and challenge and discussion to get educated about what it is and what it isn't and what it means for this specific company because it will look different for everyone. So I think um, in the beginning, that's that's what it is. You have a responsibility to understand what it is. Thank so you. you yeah. Sorry, Emily, I interrupted you. That's okay. No, I'm watching the clock. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and uh, so much of what you said resonated uh, with me with respect to, um, you know, part of it is, is partnering with the C-suite and listening and understanding and that and one size does not fit all, um, which is why we have a diversity of perspectives and industries represented on this panel. And now I'll move to Nancy to uh, weigh in on the delineation between the role of the board and management. Yeah, thank you. And I think Emily set it up. There is the overarching sort of strategy that needs to be set at a board level. And, and, and I think it really needs, as Amelia pointed out, the, the, the individualization on the company. I've seen the range of, of an Apple as a multinational, multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar organization, and then the small social entrepreneurs. And the board at the smaller social enterprises will be more deeply engaged 
I think in helping the organization at, as size appropriate and resource aligned to develop its strategy, um, a larger organization will have more resources to put on it and can have those channels of reporting that are more siloed and more accountable in, in specific ways. So it is very personalized to the organization and individualized. And in that sense, I think boards get a little flummoxed because they don't know always what their role might be in this and in this rapidly changing environment in which small public companies um, you know, have to respond and it's very different from having an accountability, sustainability department um, in there. So there's, there's a lot of, um, I would say, concern and somewhat you know, how, what, tell us what we need to be doing here to live up to our fiduciary and strategic obligations as a board. Thank you for that. And, and so bringing in another perspective, the private company perspective, um, Lisa, and you could actually weigh in both on the private company perspective and the public company perspective because you were an executive at large public, public companies. How do you delineate uh, the two roles? And, and maybe if you could um, weigh in on where, where it gets gray and how you've navigated that gray area, because I know we've discussed that in the past. I'm happy to, thank you. Amelia, well, I think I'll first um, address your comment about private versus public to say that I actually don't think it really matters too much. Um, and so kind of drafting off of some of the things that have already been said by my co-panelists, um, you know, I think we can all agree that the holy grail of responsibility of board directors is that of stakeholder value creation. Um, and it is my distinct opinion that um, it would be impossible to uphold that fiduciary responsibility without focusing on ESG. That is to say, I think there's a, there's a misnomer in the world that um, being focused on ESG is a nice thing to do, but the fact is it's a must in order to create resilient, durable companies that indeed will deliver stakeholder value. And, and so with that in mind, um, the way that I see it is that board directors with a vast um, degree of experience and certainly different perspective than that of the C-suite has an opportunity to ensure that the C-suite is focused on those ESG risks, which are most material. And I wanna stress the notion of materiality because it hasn't come up yet. And particularly in kind of this moment in time, I think that executives potentially run the risk of chasing down things that actually might not be that meaningful relative to value creation. And so um, that is one distinct responsibility that I believe regardless of private or public company. Um, another thing that is really important in my experience is ensuring that the right processes are in place to set clear goals, to measure those goals, to ensure accountability is in place, and then of course, make sure people are doing what they said. Um, again, there too, that doesn't happen by itself. And so relative to good governance, that's very much the board's responsibility. Um, again, that doesn't so much matter between public and private. The one kind of variation that I would say in my own experience as a board director um, of three private companies is um, my experience there is that as a board director, I have been in quite deeply involved in kind of those, the materiality and the kind of moving from risk mitigation to opportunistic strategies and helping the C-suite to do so in order to have a clear charter um, that informs their strategic plan and ultimately integrates ESG across the full, um, the full pipeline. Thank you so much. So um, I'm gonna pick up on some of the things that you said with respect to the board's role in financial materiality, which, which you're absolutely right. I mean, executives, uh, you know, because ESG covers so many different uh, corporate functions, um, executives can be quite broad in their, um, in their ESG commitments. And I absolutely agree with you where the board's role is to filter that and figure out which ones of those are uh, my financially material, both for value generation and also for um, risk oversight. 
Um, so uh, I really like the way that you framed uh, that. And um, I will now uh, pivot to Sylvia to talk about the delineation, but also picking up on what Lisa said to talk about the governance, because this is something that you've spent actually decades uh, working on uh, with boards um, as an executive. Um, so if you could talk about uh, both um, the delineation and the governance. Absolutely. So I, I think that you know, I agree with, with Emily that ESG risks uh, should not be um, managed by the board any differently than any other um, risk or issue within its oversight. However, I, I do think that we are living and experiencing a very significant paradigm change as it relates to ESG. Whereas, you know, uh, over a decade ago or more, um, ESG reports were glossy um, reports that it basically reported um, uh, how what what positive contributions the companies were were making in towards the environment and towards society. Um, and, and to some extent, they were viewed as marketing reports. Um, that later shifted to companies being asked to talk about how they are managing their social and environmental impacts. That is, a, as, as globalization and the speed of communication dramatically increased um, and focus on where companies were operating in remote areas of the world, um, was also increasing and, and reporting. Now we've shifted um, into a paradigm where not only do the companies have to disclose their impacts, but they also have to disclose and report on how they are making positive contributions to society and, and to societal progress. They're not just a financial engine, a profit engine, but they're also a significant contributor um, to so societal progress. And, and I think the board is feeling the, these kinds of pressures and the reg, there's an increased regulatory focus, not only on how companies are managing, but also disclosing physical and transition risks related to climate change, human capital risks, cybersecurity risks. So with the SEC and other regulatory or standard setting bodies increasing their focus on ESG reporting, and, and how that actually, uh, how a company discloses how it impacts their financial uh, performance. This really brings um, ESG front and center um, within the, the board's domain. In terms of the, the governance, um, typically what has happened historically is that the company conducts a very extensive materiality assessment, materiality not being um, couched in the same way that the SEC defines materiality, but rather materiality um, from a broad spectrum of stakeholders that are that 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 have influence or impact on the company's business and materiality vis-a-vis -vis, um, business value. So th the companies have have um, identified a range of material issues use those issues to set those their strategy, their targets, and to report uh, uh, their progress against those targets. But there is now, as I mentioned before, greater focus on those issues that are impacting our society, climate change, human capital, and cybersecurity. Those issues are now coming to the forefront, and now the boards are seen in a very unique role and a very important role to bring their specific expertise and their independence to um, management and, and oversee all of those, those, those issues as well as other significant um, ESG issues. Okay, thank you for that, Sylvia. So I'm gonna um, pick up on something that you said and ask Nancy, because I see Nancy, I saw you nodding a lot during Sylvia's system. So, that's, so that means that I wanted to talk about uh, disclosure and how that's driving how the board governs or oversees uh, ESG and anything else that resonated with you, feel free to jump in. All these comments have been resonating both in the complexity and in the fact that frameworks are developing but are not yet there. And Sylvia's comments about the different stakeholders and their expectations is another area in which I think communications are getting a little 
it, it's not clear necessarily to boards, I'm thinking about smaller companies, small public companies, how they should be communicating. If it moves out of marketing as a CSR report to really a core strategy and your organization is operating in alignment with the strategy and accountable to it, how do the communications have to evolve and become more robust and maybe more, um, what comes to mind, I keep thinking about when Starbanks Oxley was enacted and all of the yeah, compliance measures good. started coming out and all the boards were saying like, what are we supposed to be doing here? And we're going through another way in which the ESG frameworks are not yet clear. It's not standardized. There's different stakeholders, you know, from the investing community, from, you know, the, the, the litigation bar, from everything else, the activists. So they are trying to find a way that they can be compliant, I think forward thinking in order articulating the purpose, but also making sure the liability concerns I think are rising among board members too, because, and you see the SEC acting to say your climate change proposals are not as robust, they're not matching what you've got in your accountability report or your sustainability report. So there's more pressure and there's, there's I think a fair amount of questioning about what are we supposed to be doing now? <laughs> Just help us out. And I think I think that is, uh, I think it's a positive move, but I, I do think it's creating some anxiety amongst boards. Yeah, I think, so if I could, see, and Emily, go ahead, jump in. Sorry, if I could add something, I'd say, you know, one thing different about Sarbanes-Oxley is that was really sort of a top down, right? The government passed regulations. And so I think, you know, what's different about ESG is it has come from so many different places. I mean, certainly, you know, investors, but employees. I mean, a lot of people care about these issues. And so it is, you know, the World Economic Forum. I mean, it is, you know, different to, to sort of land where it should land. But I think that is an opportunity for companies because you really can own it, right? What what are your values? What is most important to you? You know, if your company doesn't use water, then you don't need to be tracking your water, right? I mean, what matters to you, your employees, you know, your stakeholders? Um, I think one thing I wanted to avoid as a board member was for us to get this compliance mindset because ISS, you know, now Glass Lewis has these, you know, these rating agencies are coming out and, and particularly because I'm with tech companies, we love numbers. We love to be able to measure and compare ourselves to others. So there's a real temptation to let's, oh, let's disclose what we need to disclose to get our ISS ratings up. We really haven't fundamentally embraced what it is and how we can use it strategically, you know, in the business. So I think, you know, from that point of view, I think the board could, you know, no one wants it to be a flavor of the month. And there is, at least for some of my, a couple of my companies, there has been a wait and see attitude because Sarbanes took so long to sort out and change, you know, the different things and that, and let's wait and see if it goes to court, you know, and all these kinds of things. So, it, you know, I think for us, it has been, to recognize this is a real thing and this is an opportunity and let's not be a laggard. Let's see what matters to us in our business. You know, when you think about how difficult it is to hire and maintain employees now, you know, it, it really makes sense to be embracing this from a business point of view, not because we're waiting for the SEC to rule on it in some way. Yeah, I think that that is such a crucial point. Thank you for identifying that distinction between um, Sarbanes Oxley with respect to one, the risk of not having a compliance a, a mindset, not being too numbers driven, but also that it's bottom up and not top down. I think that that is uh, such an important point and it emphasizes what we're talking about in this panel, which is how do you get information and partner with the C-suite uh, so that you know that you're responding to all of those different constituencies, employees, NGOs, communities, uh, et cetera. Um, so maybe I'll move now to those concrete examples. Um, and uh, maybe I'll move to Sylvia, because it looks like she's ready to jump in. <laughs> I know you have many examples. I am. Uh, I mean, it, I think the not just our industry, but, but um, many companies are really moving towards a centralized ESG governance framework with clear accountability and formal controls and even attestation processes to verify the ESG data that is um, not only in the 10Ks, but also in the sustainability reports. There'll be a layer of, of ESG information or, or, or issues um, that the SEC is focusing on now, which is climate, 
human capital and cybersecurity. But I think that 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 range of issues will only expand. And I agree with Emily and, and with Nancy, the boards are questioning and asking what is their role in that oversight in establishing the right processes and controls um, over the, the capture and, and analysis of ESG data. Um, what are the policies and procedures that are around information governance? And what, is the, what are the processes they have in place for data quality review? And how, what kind of uh, role does the, the, does the board have in this control um, and, and, and data quality process, as well as control over the metrics, targets, and KPIs that the, that the company sets, not only with respect to the three issues that I've mentioned, but with respect to material issues to the financial performance of the company. Because I think it was mentioned before, there's not a one size fits all. And just because the SEC is saying, these are important and these are the issues that we want you to um, talk about more. And we want you to talk about them, not just in your sustainability reports, but we want them to be consistent with your 10 case. There are other issues that, that may be very material um, to, to a company's right to operate that should be within that control and, and quality, ESG quality review. So I'm really excited that we have lots of questions from the audience, which I'm gonna uh, hope to weave in here. Um, but I did promise, we did promise concrete examples of effective uh, C-suite and board collaboration. Um, and we have a wealth of concrete examples, probably a tech, a book, I think in textbook terms, uh, <laughs> um, of concrete examples here, but let's just get to a few. Um, Lisa, can you provide some you know, tactical uh, examples of how you've partnered with the C-suite uh, to effectively advance uh, ESG goals? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I, I, I'll use an example that comes from Eileen Fisher. It's uh, a board that I have served on for three years. I think it's important to say up front that Eileen Fisher is a certified B Corp um, as such, there are inherent values that have been within the DNA of the company throughout its 36 year history that in many ways were ahead of its time, I suppose, relative to the types of things we're talking about now um, with regard to ESG and those companies that haven't been oriented in that way. Um, and so in the case of Eileen Fisher, in some ways, the, my, my and my fellow board peers responsibilities have been about magnifying the great practices that they have going within the companies in order to create outsized um, outcomes related to their responsible practices. A couple of examples are related to circularity and regenerative farming. I won't get into those details because they're very specific to the industry, but what I want to emphasize that has been touched upon many times over already, um, but I think oftentimes repetition is a good thing in, in conversations like this. The notion of adopting a framework, committing to measurements of that framework, and then communicating the results, whether that's through disclosures formally or not, you know, depending on the type of company it is, frame, measure, communicate. Like those are kind of the three simple steps that we've adhered to at Eileen Fisher. Um, and as such have been able to create integration across the company and from the company to the board, um, accountability relative to delivering on what matters most. In this case, a lot of the physical risks related to apparel production, of course, um, have to do with material. Um, no pun intended with materiality, but it happens to be true. Um, and so, um, I, helping the executive team to identify that, to develop meaningful strategies that will ultimately extend the reach of the practices that they had already been partaking in to make them even bigger and ultimately create greater resilience and durability of the company has been very key to, to the success um, and, and also the future of that company. Yeah, thank you for that, Lisa. And I can't, I think the point that you made is so important, which is that picking a framework 
really forces information to flow between the C-suite and the board. And, and even if you have your sustainability report happens to be amazing um, and, and a little bit unique because of that benefit corporation status, but even if you shred that report and never disclose it, just the process of creating it um, forces accountability internally. Um, and that's something that I, that I uh, have appreciated through um, our conversations. Now, I'd like to turn to Nancy for a concrete uh, example of um, effective collaboration with the C-suite. Um, I, I love, Lisa, the whole framing of it and how you get there. Let me take a different tack, which is how difficult it is for a small public company to navigate this. They are overwhelmed by consultants offering their services, each of whom is presenting a different framework from which to pick and then asking them to measure different things. And they are, the intentions are good, but the decision trees are not clear yet. And there's sort of an overwhelming sense of how do we pick which horse to ride in on, what framework is gonna be right, and how do we then have accountability and reporting up to the board. And that navigation is not easy. And so there is someone dedicated at this company to looking at that and trying to gather data, You know, pick a framework with some support from board members, not as a formal committee, um, as an informal sort of working group to try and help them move that forward so they can get to the more measured, frame it, measure it, report it, that um, I long for in Lisa's description when we, when we finally get there, but that's an outcome that um, is messy in the process. So I think companies that are starting to engage in this should appreciate that it is not clear sailing to get to that result, that there will be need for conversation between the board members and the C-suite as to how they want to progress to that, that beautiful outcome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nancy. And that, that working group is also really important. You don't have to build governance structures, um, you know, like change the audit committee charter tomorrow, but having, you know, um, when you're early in your journey, having a, a formalized structure where you can share information between the C-suite and the board through the through a working group that includes both more board members and executives is, is a really good um, example. Um, Emily. Mm -hmm. We had a, a similar situation as Nancy described, but I'd say in general, you know, uh, one important thing about the board is managing the agenda. You know, where are you spending your time? Because it is limited, right? You only meet so many times a year and having that face time to make discussions because ideally the material sent out in advance and everyone's read that. So you're in discussion in the meeting. So one thing I think boards can do is put it on the agenda. You know, whether you do it once a year or once a quarter. And, and that has sort of this ancillary effect is that of course management wants to have something to present. They want to have something good to present. So in our case, you know, we'd signed up for the course that Amelia may have spoken about. There's many, but the one we liked was the series uh, Berkeley one. And so we invited NomGov because we assigned it to NomGov as a, as a starting point, right? Because it's going to evolve what the board committees do, but it's good to have structure. So I'm head of NomGov. We took on this role. So we found this, decided we were going to do it. We invited members of management. They could or they couldn't, but they, of course, somebody did, right? Because they want, we want to be together with the same language and learning. And so, you know, once you put it on the agenda, then it sort of the structure sort of follows because number one, you talk to people and hear about it, but then to have a steering committee, right? Uh, an oversight, you know, to think about we're going to do it every quarter and then comp committee wants, you know, wants to know how they might be involved. And so if you take the long view and say, you know, it's going to take us a few years to figure this out and that's okay. And, you know, so for instance, on comp, we said, let's put in some, you know, metrics and we're going to act we're going to measure as if it were going to pay out. It did, it's not going to pay out, but we're just going to go see what it would have paid out if we had done this. We already had safety in some of those already, but to, and it was just a real learning experience. It was a safe experiment. Now, if the numbers are really great, management may wish we were counting it in comp, but if we're way off, it, 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 it's, it just shows how important it is to measure it and to say that one actually was hard to measure. That didn't make sense. So by the time I think it's really incorporated into comp, it'll probably be another two or three years, but we will have had practice. We'll have some muscles that we've built up to think about these things and, and talking about both. So, you know, I think that has worked for a couple of companies that I'm, that I'm with. 
get it on the agenda and everything follows from that yeah, yeah that, it's, that, it's get it on the oh, that get it Oh, they, they get it on, and I, I know Sylvia is going to agree with getting it on the uh, agenda because uh, in her new role, she's been on the board's agenda, as I understand it. Um, uh, but it's such a uh, sort of practical piece of advice that I recently worked on a report where I said, well, why don't we just add this? And I was like, well, that's obvious. Well, actually, maybe it's not obvious, you know, to just the power that putting it on the agenda has. Um, so, so Sylvia, you've been on the board's agenda uh, a lot quite recently. Um, can you give us some insights there? Sure. Um, I have two examples, but I, I love um, Emily's reference to getting it on the agenda because how do you get it on the agenda? It's not, I don't think companies should wait for a crisis or a regulatory pressure or any other um, issue by issue um, ad hoc type of, of management of, 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 of ESG issues. We've got to take a step back and this is something that I'm actively working on with the board and looking at corporate um, and looking at committee charters as well as board charters. So you look at the audit committee, for example, um, is there uh, the responsibility to oversee risk management processes, ensuring that ESG risks are adequately, adequately identified and, and, and managed? Um, are they overseeing ESG risks, um, disclosures and financial filings? Are they comparing it with the sustainability reports? Are they ensuring that there's integration of ESG risks into the ERM processes? Um, you look at the charter for the nominating and governance committee. Um, what are the skill sets and matrices of, of, of these boards and, and these committees? Do they have the skill sets and, and expertise to confront the issues that the company is confronting with respect to its material issues and its, and its, and its right to operate? And then you have the talent or compensation committees or, or similar. And uh, are they work? Does their charter allow the, the, that committee to incentivize or reward or, or hold the executives accountable for um, ESG targets that are tied to their compensation? There, so I would first take, a, and this is what we're doing, taking a step back in addition to your sustainability committee or your sa safety environmental or health committee, which is what we have that typically oversees ESG, you've got to look at the other committees, the audit, the governance, talent, and otherwise, and see how ESG is integrated in, into their charters. That's how you get it into the agenda. Then there'll be a, a, a methodical and, and organized way to say that you know, every time that that committee gets together, they're going to receive an update on you know, whatever targets or, or goals have been discussed with that committee and the progress against those targets. Thank you. And I know that you're redrafting those committee charters right now and that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that when it, when it, when it goes live. <laughs> Absolutely. The first one. Um, thank you for that. It's, it, that the, you know, putting it in the mandate of, you know, I, I think different board committees is really important because the audits the audit committee's function as you articulated is different from the comp committee's function with respect to ESG. Now, I know that that this that you, you know, Sylvia, you've been in front of the board and 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 this is going smoothly with respect to uh, board C-suite collaboration, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes often there's barriers, there's tensions in that uh, relationship. And so I wanted to move to Lisa and ask what are some tensions uh, and how have you overcome them as a board member? Thank you for asking me that question. I actually wanted to raise my hand a few times during that conversation, but with an eye to the time, I did not. You know, I think um, one of the most common certainly is misaligned incentives, which has been alluded to many times over in our conversation so far. But I wanna actually answer your question conversely, meaning, perhaps sharing a solution versus a problem. Um, and I think that to get I'm, to the level- I'm such a law person. <laughs> oh yeah, right. And yeah, and I'm like an all is last half full girl. So here we go. Um, anyway, I, I think like so much about getting to this place of integration that we've all been referring to um, actually starts at the 
top of the food chain, and I don't mean hierarchically, I mean about a company explicitly defining from a purpose orientation why ESG matters. It can't feel like some satellite effort that, yeah, we're supposed to care about, but isn't connected into the reason for being of the company, period, um, at least in my experience. Oh, I want to bring an example. So I uh, spent a decade of my life as an executive at Nike. And Nike catches a lot of heat for a lot of things, but they actually deserve a ton of credit for a lot of things too that are ESG oriented. Um, Nike's, re Nike's vision statement is to, uh, to provide inspiration and innovation to all athletes in the world. Athletes have an asterisk and that, just, and that means um, if you have a body, you are an athlete. But a few years ago under Mark Parker's leadership, he was the CEO at the time. He was like, listen, we are not going to be able to fulfill our vision unless we adequately face the threats related. At this point, this was in a climate focus, but the th threats related uh, to our company around the environment and the changing environment. And so they redefined, or I should say they defined um, a subset of their purpose to be, yes, to provide inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, that's not changing. But in order to do that, we need to protect the future of sport for all athletes. And in that small and yet massive revision to the company's purpose statement with protect at the front end, they then rewired the company to, from you know, top down to be ESG oriented. Um, now that's a very specific and perhaps extreme example, but I want to emphasize that uh, answering your question, an obstacle is often that people don't actually viscerally understand why they should care. Right. And spending the time at the top with purpose, in my estimation, is essential to doing meaningful work. Thank you for that. And, and, and I know that, um, I know Eileen Fisher, and by the way, everybody, this is Eileen Fisher. I just want to point this out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I, I know you spend an you know, extraordinary amount of time on, on purpose. And, and this kind of, it relates to um, a, a question in the chat. So um, why is uh, purpose so important first? And second, what is the link between purpose and profitability? Because I think that a lot of people are not convinced, um, board members and executives, that there is, in fact, a link there. Um, and so, uh, Nancy? You know, I think it varies. When you start with social entrepreneurs, they are purpose-driven first, <laughs> and then sometimes chase the business model to figure out how they can be sustainable in a way that is impactful in the social area they've chosen. I think many for-profit organizations start with the profit first, and they do layer on this larger context in which they're operating. You know, my dream is that these come together and that all businesses have this purpose driven in, as Lisa so are brilliantly articulated, but it's a process and it's, I don't think we're there yet because capitalism moved in a direction that was away from the multi-stakeholder point of view and is trying to merge back. So it is different from one side, so one is more bottoms up from social entrepreneurs top down and uh, it's, it's a process. Um, and as Emily said earlier, it takes time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, um, I feel like we're running out of some time on the climate. So, you know, hurry it up already. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> Emily, what, can, can you weigh in here? Because I know that um, we've talked about, you know, how, how sometimes it's hard to navigate um, when purpose is financially material and, and, and how, we're, how are you navigating that uh, on your journey? Yeah, well, it, I mean, especially for the public companies that have these quarterly calls, right? And people are always on you. Uh, different people than maybe BlackRock or people, folks that are thinking about ESG, but as soon as you start losing money, it'd be interesting to see what BlackRock says about that. But I think that is what's hard. And I think when you're managing a business, and of course, Sylvia, understand, all of us understand that, but you know, you're worried about the next cyber breach that you might have, you know, or having trouble hiring and retaining employees. You're ha you know, you've got so many alligators you're fighting. And 
you know, I think this, this thought about learning, you know, I mean, we found this two of the companies that I'm on the board of are based in the Midwest. And so even something like a vaccine mandate, so we're a little off of ESG, but arguably as part of S, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, we went out to talk, you know, one of our factories was 30% vaccinated to say not, I'm from California, I think you should be vaccinated, but tell me what your concerns are. You know, we'd really like to understand how you think about, you know, what, so I think ESG is the same way. It's not just tree huggers, right? Which for some people might think that's what it is. And I think you need to understand, you don't have to agree with it, but you need to understand, you know, where people's, people are coming from. And I think that's how I've come to this. It takes time, you know, because I've learned that people tend to support that which they have helped create. And so if you're told you have to do something, it's hard. You know, if you're actually sitting in the room as you're debating this and talking about it and you take a little bit longer, I do think you come around and, um, you know, you understand why, why all these things are important. And, and there's examples all the time, you know, whether it's, yeah, anyway, the, the wildfires in California. I mean, you can right. now start to have relevant conversations with people, you know, I, um, about the climate, what's going on here and how is that affecting affecting all of us. So I think back to the purpose, because of course that is the beauty if you can tie it to your purpose, but can you put cyber protection in your purpose? I don't know, right? I mean, so they're all important. So we've got these C-suites that are managing a lot of different things and it's beautiful when they line up and they don't always. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I think that's the challenge for them and the board has to support them in understanding what those challenges are. So how can you make it an and rather than an either or, you know? And so I think sometimes with so many things, and I think if she is like this too, you can find something we can agree on. Let's go do that first, you know, which, whichever level, whichever it is, diversity, wherever, it, whatever it is, and, and really focus on that and not focus. Because if you try to do too many things, you do none of them very well. So why don't you pick one and do it well and feel good about it. And then next time pick more, right. And get more aggressive, more, you know, people involved. Yeah, that consent. I've, I've, I've watched you, Emily, do that consensus building uh, very, very effectively. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think it takes longer, uh, but it's more durable and resilient uh, in terms of making yeah. ESG a part of the yeah. culture. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we say you have to go slow to go fast. You know, I love that. And, and you, you see that, right? Whenever you planned a project and you take a little bit longer to understand what everybody's, where they're coming from and the execution, you know, is so much faster than, you know, that way. So I, I, I it depends, but I think particularly for boards, you know, you're not in there to make a decision and force people to do it. That's not what boards do. You know, you've got that one nuclear option, which is to replace the CEO. And that's not a lever you want to pull very often, if you know, unless you have to. Okay, that consensus so, building is, uh, is, is, is crucial. And I know Sylvia wants to, to jump in probably on that point. Well, but I, I just think, um, thinking about purpose and, and ESG, I, I, th I think of purpose as the why. The why the, the, the company exists um, and executes its strategy as opposed to the, the what or the how through the vision and the mission. And if you put that purpose into today's context, there's been a huge paradigm change um, through the issues of, of climate and human capital and COVID. COVID has really forced companies and shareholders are really looking at how companies are managing their people and their workforce not only in terms of health and safety, but also well-being. What kind of work environment are they creating for their employees so that they can thrive, so that there is a healthy succession of talent, so that that talent feels like it's part of the achievements and the critical issues, not just ESG issues, but the critical issues that the company has to deliver um, on its purpose and strategy. Um, you're also looking at climate as a huge paradigm changer. Companies, I don't think there is a single private or public company out there that isn't looking at a climate change strategy and target, both in, you know, the, for the right to operate, 
for regulatory reasons, and even in the private sector, you know, private companies who are not regulated, it is a right to partner issue. Because if they want to partner with public companies, if they want to partner with other companies that, that are looking at these significant issues, they've got to have the right policies and processes in place that are looking and managing um, these, these significant ESG issues. Um. Thank you for that, emphasizing that the partnership, and I couldn't agree more with the, the purpose is also kind of does what Emily is saying, which it helps build consensus um, throughout the organization, not just the C-suite and the board, but throughout the organization uh, on the why. Um, and um, I wanted to make sure with our last seven minutes that we get to some audience questions. Um, so one question is, and we hear this a lot, which is, uh, this concern a lot, uh, which is, is there a need for more evidence-based research to convince boards to put the resources towards considering ESG's profitability? So do we need more data on that link between ESG and financial materiality? I will ask uh, Nancy and then Lisa. <laughs> I think data informs decision-making by boards and they can be influenced by that, but there are other stakeholders that can weigh in as well, as well as regulatory forces. So I think evidence is one part of it, but if there are regulatory forces and investor forces and employee forces building it, then it sort of completes the, the, the puzzle in which it forces them to move forward. So I think it's multiple factors, but evidence does not hurt because most board members want to be informed on a basis they can point to with some certainty. Yeah, thank you. So, and and um, and I agree. And, and something that you said really resonated, which is the investors. So, you know, there's actually a lot of data out there actually on both sides of this debate, but the investor community has is convinced that um, ESG and financial materiality are inextricably tied. And so I think that um, the best evidence for boards, if you're trying to convince your board, uh, is are the statements and the uh, priorities of the investor community. Um, Lisa. One of my favorite reads in the last 18 months or so is Rebecca Henderson's book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And one of the things that I've heard Rebecca say over and over and over again is um, the world needs powerful examples of possibility. I would rephrase that a little bit to say business leaders need powerful examples of possibility with regard to the correlation between ESG mitigating, um, mitigating strategies and powerful outcomes, that is profitability-based outcomes. So I agree more data is helpful. I also believe as a executive myself that as if board directors are able to bring into the boardroom some of these examples, they, they can just be case study based, um, that it can create a very compelling platform when you're not just talking data, but you're talking about kind of operationalizing a business against opportunities and the outcomes that that yields. Um, so for anyone interested, I'd pick up that book. There are some great examples uh, in there. And I think Rebecca is involved with series as well, as I understand. Yeah, thank you. That's a book that you noted and I and I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's really a, incredibly compelling. Um, I should make it mandatory in my classes actually. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to um, pivot to a related question, which is, oh, related to short-termism and long-termism. As a board, what are some things that you can do to ensure that the C-suite remains uh, focused on the long-term um, and um, isn't so motivated by short-term goals and, and uh, profit? Maybe I'll go to Emily. Yeah, so um, I think a, a traditional way to do it, and I've seen it work, is you have short-term compensation and long-term compensation. So short-term is cash comp and a cash bonus, in the year and long term is the are the stock options, right? That take time to vest, and they have different components. And so there's been a discussion. You know, I, I think I mentioned one company. You know, I'm working with. We have looked at comp, 
and, and putting ESG metrics in. We've tried putting some in the short-term compensation and some in LTI, long-term compensation. Obviously, like if you want to move the needle on how diverse your management team is, that takes some time. You know, it's hard to do that in a quarter or two, but yet, you know, for safety injuries or, you know, other things you can. So we've tried to put the ESG metrics in some sort of a comp or some incentive plan that goes all the way to everybody in the organization is involved in some way in the right place to sort of convey, we know it's going to take a long time to decarbonize, right? Whatever, you know, you're talking about, but to kind of recognize, and then you can put these interim measures in on the way to the big measure, right? We have to get this far this year or put these processes in place or hire these people or whatever it is. So you've got kind of a project plan. Um, I, again, for public companies, it's, it's very hard to ignore the short term. You have to have a pretty good story to be able to do that. And during COVID, we did, you know, so, um, but I think it is an and. You have to be watching, you know, the cash, you know, inventory and revenue and profits every quarter, be able to explain why they are what they are, but then be able to show this long-term improvement so that you, you can get away with it, right? You, you can't do poorly on both and keep your job and stay in business. Yeah, agree. I couldn't agree more. It's an and. It's a short term mm -hmm. and and uh, long term focus because um, you know you need you need the revenue to keep to keep going on on the right. ESG journey as well. But so and there and there's stories of. I mean, I think you know a lot of this is about the story. But when you think of tech companies, we say, "Gosh, we're completely rewriting the OS. It's going to take us three years to get it out." Right. In the meantime, we're doing this. You can tell the story, but then you have to do it. Right. Right. So. Uh, we have two minutes left, and for those of you who have been with me before, know that I never end one of these without giving each of the guests a magic wand uh, at the end. And so in the last minute or so, if if I gave you a magic wand, what would you do with it, very briefly, just a couple, a couple seconds, to remove, to, to enhance board C-suite collaboration and partnership on ESG? Lisa, you get the first magic wand. Then I give it to Emily. She passes it to Nancy. And then Sylvia gets, gets it. OK, um, with my magic wand, I am going to erase the historical connotation of ESG so that everyone understands that it is not a nice to do. It is a must to do in order to deliver one's fiduciary responsibilities as a board director and as an executive to create value for all stakeholders. So unlearn the past, harness the future. I love that. Okay, Nancy? I'm going with that. That is amazingly <laughs> well put and that would transform how these endeavors work. So I'm, I'm gonna like, like Aladdin with more than one wish, I'm gonna on <laughs> Lisa's. I thought that was brilliant and well put, thank you. Emily. Yeah, so I focus on, you know, after their magic wand erases the past, I'd, I'd like to see management and the board sort of jointly reviews a stakeholder analysis oh, um, yeah. to really understand who, and, and the management and the board are stakeholders too, right? So they, they get a voice in this as well as employees and suppliers and investors and the community and all that, and to truly embrace whatever they learn, to be open-minded and, and then see what happens after they truly understand what the stakeholders care about and, and be open to be surprised. I love that, be open to be surprised. Um, thank you so much. Sylvia, magic wand. I, I love what Lisa said. Um, I, I don't think I can say anything indifferently or, or even um, better than that. Uh, the only thing I would, would add is if we erase the short-termism, if we erase the nice to do and we focus on what each and every one of our roles are. I think we'll get there um, through purpose, through strategy, governance, targets, all these things that are very important. But also we'll get there when we realize that we, we also have a role in education. We need to educate and work with other stakeholders in government and even our customers and consumers because it's going to take every sector of our society to meet these challenges. So that's where I really, I have a pet peeve where it's not just about the company's role and the company's targets and obligations. It's the companies also bringing along other stakeholders in partnership with them 
to drive the results that we need. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we have to conclude this session, um, but I, there is somebody in the audience noting how many uh, women are involved in leading ESG, both as board members and as executives. Uh, and I just wanted to thank 50-50 uh, women on boards. It's been in existence for 11 years and really at the forefront of advocating uh, for more women on boards. It started as just um, uh, women on boards and now uh, you know, uh, with an ambitious 50-50 um, goal. Um, it's exciting to be on this journey with you. Uh, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.